So let's begin. What is the state of Apple under Tim Cook? Not a lot of people know you that well, or know, know a lot about you. You've been behind the scenes at Apple mm -hmm. for so long. How would you characterize it's, it? It's an absolute incredible time to be with Apple. And uh, I'm loving every minute of it, and I think everybody in Apple's loving every minute of it, too. You know, we've, for years, and this will not change, Apple's been focused on innovation. And never have I seen uh, the things I can't talk about today. <laughs> uh, the juices are flowing. And we have some incredible things coming out. And of course, the, the, the company and what we're doing today, the company's very healthy. We've, we've had a few uh, decent quarters. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, iPhone's doing great. Uh, you know, we've, we just finished the first half of our year, and uh, there's 70 million plus people out there more that have iPhones now, which is fantastic. Uh, iPad, I, iPad has been unbelievable, really. I mean, it, you know, for, at least in, uh, you guys have been around for a while. We've all been around for a while. Um, I've never seen a, a product and technology that consumers loved pretty instantly and business loved and education loved and people of all ages loved. The iPad has just been unbelievable. It's been a knockout. And I think we're in the first inning on it. Um, the on the iPad, you mean? On the, on the iPad. I really believe we're in the first inning. You know, it's only been two years. It's only been two years. And yet, hopefully there's a few in the audience here tonight. And uh, there's a few pretty much everywhere I go. Actually, more than a few. The Mac has had a string of incredible uh, uh, quarters where we've outgrown the market uh, basically for every quarter for six years. Outgrown the market, outgrown but the market. from a relatively small base, right? Uh, yes. Uh, we, we're, you know, the Mac has always been walled about being the best, making the best product, not making the most. Uh, we're never going to make the most personal computers. I don't see that. Um, but we are going to continue to make the best. And so the Mac has strung this together, and all of a sudden, you know, in this. I'm not sure anybody could have predicted this, but as iPod was introduced in uh, now 11 years ago, it's been 11 years, uh, even pre, pre the conference. You had sold 700,000 iPods when we opened our first yeah. conference. We sold a few more than that now. <laughs> um, iPod introduced Apple to a whole bunch of people that didn't know Apple. And the Mac benefited from that, and so many, many people began to buy the Mac. But, as it turns out, looking back, it introduced Apple to people in the developed world. So it introduced people to the Mac in the US, in the UK, in France, in Germany, uh, in Australia. But when iPhone came along in 2007, all of a sudden the world changed for Apple, and many people were introduced to Apple in China, and the Middle East, and Eastern Europe, and Russia, and Latin America. And so the world opened all of a sudden. And now, with iPad, uh, iPad is doing well in a number of those markets. And so it's been pretty incredible as, uh, as we've come out with new great stuff that the world has met Apple. But we're still in the first inning. We're still at the very beginning of this, I believe. Right, when you say that, you're what are you introducing then next week, I guess, two weeks? Hey, what's the second inning? Right. That's a great question. I know it is. It's fantastic. I'm not going to answer you it. You really should. <laughs> um, well, what do you mean by first we, inning? Well, you've like, got an event well, June 11th. What are you going to do? We're going to introduce some great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> are you it's now in the really stuff good. business? Stuff what does stuff, stuff mean? Business. 
I think you'll like it. Confetti cannon? I think you're going <laughs> to love it. You do? I think you're going <laughs> to love it. And so first inning, I said first inning relative to iPad. Right. Uh, but, but what I mean by that is I, I really believe, and I believe this from the beginning, not this is not something, some revelation from the last week or so, that the tablet market would eventually surpass the PC market. And I think everybody kind of heard that in the beginning, kind of laughed that off and said, no way. You know, there were many naysayers and, and so forth out there. Uh, today, I think there's a lot more believers in that. I, th I would guess there's a lot of people in this audience this evening that use their iPad a lot more than they use their computer. And I know I do that. And I love the Mac. But I find myself spending more and more time on my iPad. And I think as time goes on, I think that will even get more and more like that. And um, yeah, so that's the reason I think we're So let me, if I can pick up on that. Yeah, absolutely. There, we're, we're going to, the public at large is going to be exposed to a different approach to this yep. from your friends in, in Redmond this year, yep. in which they look at a tablet and what we would traditionally have called a PC is just kind of a continuum, mm -hmm. which can run on one operating yeah. system and can come in many form factors. Some of them will be just tablets, some of them will be just clamshells, some yeah. of them will be some combination where you know you can pull off the screen or turn it around, make it into a tablet. What's wrong with that? Why isn't a tablet actually a PC? Why, do, why, is, it, why is there a distinction? Well, in, in my view that the tablet and the PC are different, and the, you can do things with the tablet if you're not encumbered by the legacy of the PC, if you view it as different. And, and so I think if you, if you take a view that says this is another PC, all of a sudden you're pulling all of the leg weights of the PC market, and I think you wind up with something you may, you know, maybe not that dissimilar to what a tablet was 10 years ago. I mean, you know, we didn't invent the tablet market. It was there. We invented a, uh, the modern tablet. And, and so I, you know, I, I, I love convergence, and I think it's, convergence is great in many areas. But I, I, I think that products are about trade-offs. And you have to make tough decisions. You have to choose. And the fact is, the more you look at a tablet as a PC, the more the baggage from the past affects the product. And you wind up, I used this flip it thing uh, some months ago that uh, about, uh, you know, you could converge a toaster and a refrigerator. And sure, you could do that. And some, somebody might even say this. You're not you know, introducing okay. that next week. I'm not introducing that next week. And, um, but I, I just think that you wind up not building the best product in this particular case when you try to converge those. What dead now, weights are you talking about that you leave behind? That you oh, it's, it's trying to do uh, all the things that uh, the operating system of the PC does and, and, and perhaps should do. It's uh, trying to, uh, you know, there are people trying to converge uh, laptops and and tablets, and therefore you've got a, a clamshell kind of thing, and you're lugging this thing with you, and and so the the ID is not optimized for a tablet. You know, people want tablets to be incredibly thin, incredibly thin, and but if you look at it as a notebook, you're not going to come out of the design of the product and, and have it you know, be a kick-ass product that somebody says, wow, this is, you know, this is what I wanted. And so I'm not big on that, as you can probably tell. I, I think there are two different products. I think that, I think I, I agree that many people will, will select a tablet over a PC. And so, you know, it will clearly cannibalize the PC. And so from that point of view, at a macro point of view, they're connected. But I think if you force them together, I think the PC is not as good as it can be. And I think the tablet is not as good as it can be. So I'm not, 
we want to we want to build the best products in the world, and I, I don't think in this case you do that by pushing the two so, together. So, I think what a lot of just to switch yep. gears for a second yep. here, uh, we love to talk about products and yep. philosophy, and yep. we'll keep at it. But one of the things that people are interested in is, obviously, Apple has undergone a tremendous uh, uh, change, a big loss with the death of Steve Jobs. You're the CEO. How? How is Apple different with you as the CEO so far? What, it, what, what did you learn from Steve as CEO, and how are you, uh, how are you changing things? I, I learned a lot from Steve. You know, and it was the, it was absolutely the saddest days of my life when uh, he passed away. And maybe as much as you should you should see or predict that um, I really didn't. And uh, so, but it, at some point l late last year, I, or I, I sort of, uh, somebody kind of shook me and said, it's time to get on. And and so that sadness was replaced by this intense determination to continue the journey. And, and that's where it is today. So what did I learn from him? I learned we could be here all night, and probably all week and maybe a month. Uh, I, I learned that focus is key, not just in your uh, running a company, but in your personal life as well. That you can only do so many things great and that you should cast aside everything else. Uh, in, in business, uh, in the business that we're in, owning the uh, key technology of a product is very important. Uh, Steve was always laser focused on that and that's very much ingrained in all of us. Doing things great, not accepting good or very good, but only accepting the very best uh, that's embedded in Apple. This, this, Apple has a culture of excellence that is, I think, so unique uh, and so special. You know, I will, uh, I'm not going to witness or permit the change of it. Uh, he also taught me that the joy is in the journey and uh, which is a revelation for me. And, and I think he taught all of us that life is fragile. And that, uh, you know, we're not guaranteed tomorrow and so give it everything you got. Now, now wait, let me ask you, you yeah. said that you want permitted to change, but things do change. Right. What, what, are, what well, is different for you Carol, though? Do you have, yeah. I mean, you don't want to be the, you don't want to live in a museum, presumably, or? No, 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 I don't believe in, I, I love museums, but I don't want to live in one. And Apple, uh, another thing that Steve taught us all was to not focus on the past, is to uh, be future focused. If, if you've done something great or done something terrible in the past, get on with it and forget it and go on and create the next thing and the next thing. And so when I say that I'm not going to witness or permit the change, I'm talking about the thing that's most important in Apple, the culture of Apple. Uh, this is something that I think is so special and so unique and is not something that people could replicate. If they could, I think everybody would be like this. Well, they try. They try, but, but you, can't, you can't just, you can't get a consultant report and replicate it. Uh, you, you can't just change your organization to look like Apple and all of a sudden have it. This is something that's in the DNA and the fabric of the company, and this I'm not going to change. Am I going to change anything? Of course. So you can know, you give us some examples of how things have changed or what you might what, change? What's, the thing, you know, Steve told me um, when he, when he, called me to his home to talk about being the CEO and then, and then subsequently the discussions we had. He, he told me, he said, you know, I witnessed what happened at Disney uh, when Walt passed away. And he said that people would go to meetings and conference rooms and so forth and they would all sit around 
and talk about what would Walt have done? How would he view this? What decision would Walt make? And he looked at me with those intense eyes that only he had, and he told me to never do that, to never ask what he would do, just do what's right. And so I'm doing that. And so does that mean that something will be different? Of course, but he was the best person in the world about doing this. He, he would get, uh, he would flip on something so fast that you would forget that he was the person that was taking the 180 polar position on it the day before. I mean, Give me an example. Was, he, he, did, he did that here on the stage. That. He did that here on the stage many times. But he was, it was an art. And you would never know that he thought the opposite. We actually have videotape, but, but go ahead. Well, so you've got proof. I saw it daily. I saw it daily, and, and this is a gift. Because this is a gift because things do change. And it takes courage to change and courage to say, I'm now wrong. Maybe I was right before, but maybe not. Maybe I was never right. It takes courage to do that. And I think he had that. So I the stories that, that we're, yeah. th that are trickling out about, I don't know, things are a little more relaxed or you've introduced this policy or that policy. I mean, is, is there some deliberate Oh, you know, I've read some of this. I don't read a lot of it. The philanth uh, philanthropic Oh, yes. I mean, I, my, my belief, Walt, on philanthropy is uh, the Kennedys used to say this, and uh, I believe it strongly in my heart, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I do believe this. It's embedded in me. And, and yes, and so Apple has started a matching gift program. The employees really love it. Uh, it allows us to reach thousands of charities and plant seeds everywhere, and it allows us to do so without the bureaucracy of something where a lot of people sit in a committee meeting to conclude whether this one's good and this one's good. We let the employee decide. And so we've done that, and yes, we participate in some other things, and, and, and I think we can do even more, and so we're looking at some things, and. You know, we'll talk about them when we're ready. And so maybe that's a change. Although Steve clearly knew about the matching gift thing, and he was alive then, and he was for it. And so, you know, do I feel really strongly about it? Yes, I do. Uh, it, it, I think it's impossible to say what he would have done or not have done. Uh, the dividend thing, some people have talked about this. Uh, I think we did the right thing by, uh, or we, we're, we'll do it later in the year, of starting dividends and doing some share buybacks. And the, the, you know, the, the truth is the uh, company's been very successful. Uh, the cash in the company has built up. And when we think about the things we want to do and the, the uh, we're going to continue to invest like crazy in R&D. We're going to continue to build out stores. We're going to continue to do things I'm not going to talk about. We're going to continue <laughs> to, to build up the infrastructure. What's the budget okay. of those okay. things? But we've, got, but we've got some money left over. We have a little bit left over, and we should share it. No, and no, so I've we've actually heard you're a lot less secretive, actually. That's a lot less secretive. That you're not going to... No, I'm No, I tell you what. I, the, here's the way I, I view the secretive I was hoping you'd be fooled thing. by that question. No, I'm not fooled at all. Okay. Uh, I'm not easily fooled, hopefully. We're going to double down on secrecy on products. Wow. We're going really? to double down. I'm double very serious. Down? I'm very serious. I want to double down on this. However, there's going to be other things that we do that are, we're going to be the most transparent company in the world on. Like and what? Like, um, like when, when social change. Like when uh, uh, supplier responsibility on what we're doing for the environment. We're going to be the most transparent because we think that transparency is so important in these areas and that if we are, other people will copy what we're doing. And in this area, I want people to copy us. What do you There's mean some by other areas I don't want them to yeah, copy. I get it. But this one I do. What do you mean by social change, the first one of those you mentioned? Oh, I mean, I'm thinking about the, the, uh, all the work we're doing in, in manufacturing with our suppliers. 
would you assess that you have been transparent in the past, or how would you assess what's gone on before? In the past, we did a annual report, and that was our method of transparency. And uh, did we do more than others? I think most people would look at that and say yes. Our actions were clearly much more, but our communication was once per year. It was an annual thing. Uh, now, we're putting out monthly reports. We want everyone to know we're, what we're doing, and we hope that people copy. Is that I enough? hope they Is do. that enough in China? Talk, assess the China situation, because you have many critics. Um, you have many uh, criticisms, not just fictional ones, uh, but you have ones that are very valid, criticism of what went on in China. How would you assess what you're changing to what the manufacturing practice is there? Why isn't there an Apple uh, factory in China, run by Apple, done by Apple? Well, there's a lot of questions in there, so let, let me try to yeah. take those one by one a little bit. Why don't we do it? We decided over a decade ago uh, that there were things that uh, we could do better than anyone else, and those things we wanted to do ourselves. And then we looked at other things and said, you know, somebody else can do those better than we can or as good as we can, and we shouldn't put our effort into those. Manufacturing was one of those. The operational expertise and the engineering around it uh, and the whole supply chain management stuff is all, Apple is doing all of that. But manufacturing itself, we looked at it and said, you know, we can, somebody else can do this as good as we and can. And is that still true? I think you it's just still true. finished saying things I think you change, right? I think it's still true. I think, uh, but in terms of the, the uh, what, how are the factories doing, uh, this year as an example, we put a ton of effort into uh, taking overtime down. Now this, this sounds, it probably sounds easy to, to people in the audience. This is actually hard because it's complex because some people work, want to work a lot. Some people want to work a whole lot because they want to move and work for a year or two and then move back to their village and bring back as, as much money as they can. We, we've sort of taken a position and said, we're going to bring this down. And we're already up in the, uh, the last month, we were at 95% compliance. We're measuring working hours for 700,000 people. I don't know anybody else doing this. And we're reporting it. And so you could go on our website and see precisely what the work hours are. It's almost like the labor report the US puts out, you know, where it comes out at 5.30 a.m. in the morning. We put it out at the end of every month, or at the beginning of the following month on, on what we did the, the month before. And so we're micromanaging that. And I think we're doing it in a way, and we're showing a level of care that I don't think, I don't see in, uh, in other places. And uh, I think it's really important. And so this is an area where I think we're advanced, and I hope people rip us off blindly. So, uh, it, but let me just pursue yeah. this for a second. There's been a lot of attention just in the last month or so to the revival of manufacturing in the United States. Yeah. Wall Street Journal uh, today had a, had a piece about wages in the United States being you know, relatively attractive for mm -hmm. manufacturers, productivity being high. You used to have factories and you used to have at least one factory I can recall in the US, I think in Colorado somewhere. Do you ever see the possibility I mean, you're a huge company. You're, I would say, you're certainly the most influential company in tech and maybe the most or one of the most in any industry. Do you, and you're an operations mm -hmm. expert. Yep. Things do change. There is some manufacturing revival in the US. Will there be an Apple product ever made again in the United States? I want there to be. You what? I want there to be. You want there to be. I want there to be. And, uh, We've already, this is not well known, or, uh, but the engine for the iPhone and the iPad are built in the U.S. In Austin? Not just for the U.S., but for the world. In Austin? Somewhere? In Austin. Yeah. Uh, the glass on your iPhone is made in a plant in Kentucky. Uh, not just for the U.S., but for other markets outside the U.S. as well. And so I think there are things that can be done in the U.S., not just for the U.S. market, but can be exported for the world. Now, people focus, there's an there's a intense focus on the final assembly because that's the part that 
uh, most people look at and say, oh, that, you know, it's an iPhone. They don't think about all of the parts underneath that are, are where the significant value of the, of the uh, bill of material is. And so on the assembly piece, could that be done in the US? I hope so one day. Uh, the, the, the truth is the tool and die maker skill in the US begin to go down in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, how many tool and die makers do you know in the US now? We could have, I could call a meeting around the United States and say, would every tool and die maker come to this room tonight? You, we wouldn't fill the room. In China, you would need several cities to fill with tool and die makers. And so there has to be sort of a fundamental change in the education system, et cetera, to bring back some of this. But there are things that we can do, and, and that's what we're working on doing. The semiconductor industry is fantastic in the United States. You know, we should do more semiconductors in the United States. The, the, the Corning deal with glass in Kentucky, yeah. this, this is fantastic. And so we will do as many of these as we can do, and you can bet that we will use the whole of our influence to do it. Uh, so, so will it ever say on the back of an Apple product designed in California, assembled in the United States? It may. It may. And, and even though it doesn't say that today, you could put down there, uh, several parts are from the United States. <laughs> of course, we're not Well, gonna... I can't put anything down there. You can put it down there. <laughs> That could be your signature, a lot of words. There you go. Simplicity. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we'd come up with a, with a better way of saying it, but, but, but it is important. And now, I, I do want to point out something, though, and I think this is so very important, is that if you look at um, developers, you know, uh, the, the word, if you, I loved your uh, D1 to D10 mm -hmm. thing in the beginning of this. If you think back at D1, D2, D3, probably all the way to five or six, uh, how many people knew what a mobile app was? Well, there were a few. There I mean, few, on the trio, but, but it or wasn't Blackberry. sort of coming out of people's mouths. Yeah. Now it's in the mainstream, and now in the U.S., there are hundreds of thousands of people developing apps. And so this is something. This whole segment of the economy didn't exist just a few years ago, or it was nascent. Now, incredible innovation is going on in mobile apps. You know, the, as a matter of fact, from an app point of view, if you looked at innovation on the PC, we were talking about this earlier, you're hard pressed to come up with very many companies that are innovating like crazy on applications on the PC. I feel that we are, and there are some others, but the list is small in reality. You could hold a meeting in here and of every PC developer, and you wouldn't have very many people there. But if you said, let's have a meeting, a convention of mobile apps for everyone in the US that's doing mobile apps, you'd need several football stadiums. So and it's incredible. It's, a, it's, a, it's so big. It's, it's big enough to be in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So in that vein, why have a PC? Why should Apple be a PC? Well, because I don't, see the, I don't see the tablet replacing the need for all PCs or all Macs. I mean, I, so I don't mean to imply that at all. I, 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 hopefully I haven't done that. Is what I see is that the tablet, for some people, takes over what their PC was about for them. And it will probably also extend the purchasing cycle for others, where they'll say, you know, I want both, but I've got a budget, and so I'm going to buy this tablet probably more often than I'm going to buy my, my PC or, or my Mac in some cases. So speaking of innovation, let's talk about the patent wars that go on. Yeah. Apple, Samsung, Google. Is that a problem for innovation? Well, it's a pain in the ass. Okay. Uh, is, it, is it a problem for innovation? Um, I think it's, from, from our point of view, it's important that Apple not be the developer for the world. We can't take all of our energy and all of our care 
and finish the painting and have someone else put their name on it. We can't have that. And so, you know, the worst thing in the world that can happen to you if you're an engineer and you've given your life to something is for someone to rip it off and put their name on it. And, and so what, what we want to accomplish is we just want people to invent their own stuff. And we don't want to be the developer for the world. But there are people accusing you of ripping them off. I'm sure right? there are people accusing us of everything. No, no, come on, Tim. I mean, you know this. This is all yes. over the world in every oh, course. It's not just like I, you're suing other people. Other people are suing you. Oh, of course. Yes, and, and when you look at those, the vast majority of those are on standards essential patents. And this is an area where the patent system is broken today. You know, standards essential patent carries with it a responsibility by the person who owns the patent to license it in a fair and reasonable and non So what's one example of a stand, just in, in case there aren't, uh, oh. everybody isn't Except a patent Except for Nathan, lawyer. Uh, Nathan it's, it's something that- yeah, Nathan knows, but- I mean, let me just make it simple, is it's something fundamental to connecting to the 3G network. Okay. You know, where you, there's no way you could design a product without whatever this is. And, and so the, the, the issue with the system, as I see it, relative to this, there are other issues, and I'm sure you'll get into those later in, in the conference, but the issue is that this is an economic argument. It's not an, ar there should be no, uh, no one should be able to get an injunction off a of standards essential patent because the, the owner of the patent has the responsibility to license it on a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory manner. And so, so when somebody comes to you and tries to uh, you know, get some obscene level of money mm -hmm. from you for this, they're in essence telling you they're not going to license it and because they want to go try to get an injunction and, and use the court system to do that. And in my view, uh, use it in a way that it wasn't intended. So no. are, just so I get this straight, yeah. are you saying, and I want to put words in your yeah. mouth, that's why I'm asking. You're saying that when you sue somebody, it's because you finished the painting and they're ripping you off. I've never and sued anyone. And when people are suing you, it's because they're trying to get more money than they should get under the way standard essential patents are understood. At and nobody else has, ha, feels they've done a painting that you've ripped off. Well, there's a lot of stuff in, the, in that. I can't tell you how people feel. Uh, I, I don't want, like people talking about how I feel and I, I don't represent how other people feel. But what, what I'm saying, Walt, is that uh, Apple has not sued anyone over standards essential patents that we own because we view that it's fundamentally wrong to do that. This was n never the intention of a standards essential patent. The intention was that some payment be made. Yeah. And you can always argue about the payment, and there has to be a, a forum for resolving those disputes. But the problem in this industry is, if you add up what everybody says the standards essential patents are worth, no one else could be in the phone business. Competition would be locked out. And so it's kind of gotten crazy. This is, one, this is one issue. And so there's some of this that is maddening. That it's a waste. It's a time suck. However, does it stop innovation? Uh, it's not going to stop us from innovating, no. Uh, but it's overhead. It's overhead that I wish didn't exist. And if we can find a way to settle this, then... And, but you just had settlement talks with... I read that in the paper, but I can't Choi. talk about it. I, I oh, you can't talk, talk about no, it at all? No, no, the magistrate asked us not to talk about it. So. The magistrate? No, no, this is D. We're like <laughs> oh. exempt from the magistrate. Oh. He is the magistrate. I'm sorry, he didn't tell me that. So, so Let so me get him in, on my... In that vein, <laughs> in that vein how, do you, how do you like Google's painting? 
Pretty? <laughs> Tacky? What? I love Apple's painting. Okay. I know love that. Apple's painting. We know. And Google's painting. You can talk about Rim's painting a little bit, but mostly I'm interested. You know, I don't. I don't want to talk about other companies. I, I, I. You brought up patents, and so I brought up something that I feel passionate about, as you might tell, that I think is an abuse of the system that that was not intended, and I do think it needs. Um, I think it needs fixed, and, and I'm hoping that uh, some of the regulators and so forth will will charge at this and begin to, to fix well, it. Well, then how do you look at the competitive landscape in the smartphone market? Where is it moving? Because you all dominated influence and, and, and money making in that area. I wouldn't say we dominated. Uh, I, you know, I think we have the best phone, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, the, you have two operating systems today, st start, starting at the software, the operating system level, you have two operating systems uh, that make up the vast majority, and of course it's uh, iOS and Android. And you have uh, Windows Mobile now beginning to, to ship, and we'll, we'll see how they do. Uh, and then you have RIM that is um, uh, still serving uh, you know, some, some large number of enterprise customers. Um, but the, the momentum right now are, are in the first two. And so will that change? I think, I think that anything can change because, because I think we're in the early, uh, we're in the smartphone revolution is still in the early stages. You know, the, when, you, when you really back up and look at this, uh, this market's a billion unit market in three years from now. And a few years after that, I'm not sure you'll see very many phones in the world that aren't smartphones. So the opportunity here is huge, and there can clearly be changes along the way. So uh, along those lines, yeah. one thing that's happening on the Android side of the equation uh, at a lot of the OEMs and uh, I've heard, I've talked to a lot of them about this and some have talked about it publicly is they're, they're looking to make fewer models. There are lots of models of Android phones. I think some people... I wonder where they got that idea. I wonder where they got that <laughs> idea. They're looking to focus, okay? Yeah, yeah. And so they have yet to have, even given the Samsung Galaxy S2, which was uh, probably the best, I, I don't know for sure, but I think was the best selling, uh, if you, particularly if you group them all, all the galaxies together, they were the best-selling Android smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, they really haven't had a phone that's a, a single model that's a hit like the iPhone has been a hit. On the other hand, you've had this hit phone, and you do have a platform, but you've only had this one fo new phone at a time policy. I know that you sell last year's model for $99, and the year before that's model for zero, and I, so I understand there's three iPhones in the market, but at any one time there's only one, been one new iPhone. That's not the way you did it with the iPod. That's not the way you did it with the Mac. Uh, why don't you have more than one iPhone and why don't you have more than one iPad and is there any chance you might? Well, you know, our North Star is to, is to make the best product. And so we're not, our objective isn't to make this design for this kind of price point or make this design for this arbitrary schedule or, or line up uh, you know, other things or have, have X number of phones. It's to build the best. And so that doesn't preclude, there's not a policy. You use the word policy, Walt. Well. There's not a policy or a commandment that thou shalt have one or, or whatever. There's a, uh, over, we have an overriding belief of making the best. And so if we find that we can do more great, uh, do we have to? I think one of our advantages, quite frankly, is that we're not fragmented. People that, uh, if you look at when we introduce a new OS, uh, 
uh, iOS 5, it's amazing the percentage of our install base that's on the latest OS. That's not the case with Android. Right. Uh, we have one app store. The rules are, are simple and straightforward. Everybody might not agree with all of them, but it's simple and straightforward and all the apps are there. And so you know what app store to go to. This is not the case. We have one phone with one screen size, with one resolution. And so it's pretty simple if you're a developer developing for this platform. And there's been all kind of people that have wild success. I mean, look at, uh, you probably saw that Facebook brought Instagram. Instagram had we one that. product on, on iOS. And so I, I think it's a testament of the power of iOS in a lot of ways. But I think Walt's point was that there's several different iPods. They look different. Yes. They're different yes. colors. I mean, yes. even but colors. The key on and you guys used to, and your, your, your folks used to say, they said it to me, yeah. look, we've got all these price point covered. Yeah. They didn't say, we've got them all covered with junky iPods. They felt like they were all great iPods, built for a certain market at a certain price, right. and built with high quality. So there's a yeah. large, let, let me you, say that you just, said this yourself. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the first inning. There's a lot of the world out there that can't afford yeah. $200 phones. Why couldn't you make, or why shouldn't you be making a $99 new iPhone that's designed around that Point for a certain kind of market, and still you mm -hmm. could be just as proud of it as you are of your other children. Yeah, who, who knows what we'll do in the future? I'm not going to uh, conjecture on that. But on the iPod, it wasn't that we sat around and said, you know, we need a $49 one and a $99 one and so on and so forth. It was, we could do a pretty cool product called the iPod Shuffle. And it got better and better over time, smaller and smaller, and, and, and now you can just clip it on, and you know, I wear it every day for working out. And, and so each of the products were great products, but, and the result of that, one of the results, not, not, it didn't start as the objective, but one of the results were we could have different price points. And so whenever, like the Mac, like the iPod, whenever we can do some fantastic products and they yield different price points, then we're all for that. We don't have a religion to not sell anything below X. Or, sure, but I think Walt's point is, is there someone in that room going, couldn't we make a cool, smaller iPhone? Couldn't we make a cool iPhone with a bigger screen? Is that Could, happening? Couldn't we make a seven inch tablet or an eight inch tablet? I'm going to have to invite you guys to our, our meetings. Okay, all right. <laughs> we'll accept it. We'll be there. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, speaking of new products no. you're not going to discuss in any way, which is highly disappointing to me right now. But uh, it's highly surprising. Yes, that. I know. Um, TV. Steve talked a lot in his last appearance here about wanting to change television, quite adamantly. He uh, was very passionate about it, about the entertainment industry. The iPad's become an entertainment consumption device for a lot of people. How are you looking to change television from what he was talking about initially? Well, you know, we've, um, very uncharacteristic of us, we've stayed in the Apple TV uh, product business, and we've, we've continued our la latest iteration of that just shipped uh, 60 days ago or so. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not a hobby kind of company, as you know. We, our tendency is to do very few things, put all of our wood behind a few arrows. And if something creeps in and isn't a big success, we get it out of the way and, and move on and put our energies on, on something else. Apple TV, though, you can see what we've done, and we've, we've stuck in this. Now, it's not. It's, a, it's not a uh, fifth leg of the stool. It's not of the same market size of an, a phone business or, a, or the Mac business or the music business or the, the tablet business. It's not like that. But you know, last year, we, we sold about a little less than 3 million Apple TVs, 2.8 million. This year, just in the first six months of our year, we've sold 
And so we've kind of almost equaled last year. And of course, that was helped by the by bringing the Apple TV up to 10, 1080p and and uh, supporting uh, movies in the cloud and, and some other things. And you know, it's a key part of the ecosystem. And so this is an area of intense interest for us. Many of us, the TV that we do watch is almost exclusively on it. That's what my TV watching is. All of my movies, everything is, is coming through Apple TV. And so people, the customer sat with that product is incredible. It's, it's off the charts. And so we're going to keep pulling this strain and see where it takes us. Uh, I think most people, I, maybe not all, but I think many people would say this is an area in their life that they're not really pleased with. You know, they might not be pleased with many things about it. Uh, with the, TV, the whole TV experience. And so it's an interesting area. So we'll have to see what we do. But, so uh, right now, our contribution is Apple TV. And right, right we're now, really good but, about it. But it's, there's an interesting question about, I mean, there's been, you know this. We shouldn't be coy about it. There's been a ton written about you doing a television set, which sounds like, an old, sounds like a crystal radio when you say television set. But I mean, you know, the whole box with mm. the, big panel in it and the whole thing. Because frankly, if you forget about the Apple TV or some other set-top box you have connected, that device uh, has a user interface that looks nothing like what you would think was a good user interface. And there's a lot of other issues with it. Do you think, if we could talk hypothetically, because I know you're not going to tell me, or I'll, I'll ask, are you making a television, an entire television? You were right. I'm not going to tell you. All right. So let's be <laughs> hypothetical for a minute. Were you to be making a television? As you, as you think about improving the television experience, because you just said you're thinking about that, um, does it, can it be done with a, with a box and leave the kind of big panel and everything to other people and just really build a lot of smarts and software and other things into a, a box and not build the whole thing? Here's the way Walt, we would look at that. Is whether it's you or anyone. We would look not just at this area, but other areas, and, and ask, can we control the key technology? Can we make a significant contribution far beyond what others have done in this area? Uh, it, can we make a product that we all want? Because we think we're reasonably good proxies for, for others. And so those are all the things that we would ask about any new product category. Uh, it's the ones we ask about uh, products within families that we, we've already announced. And so these, this is sort of how we, think, how we think about it and how we look at it. So is what Apple TV today an, a good enough, something that pleases you since you use it? Well, I love the product. Uh, But I, th I think Apple TV is more of something that you keep pulling the string to see where it Because right you. now, to be honest, I mean, I use mine a, a lot. You don't have a lot of content on there. You could have a lot more content on Apple TV. Well, well we have lots of movies. Uh, Netflix customers love it. I know exactly what's on there, Tim. Yeah. I've reviewed it. I've reviewed every yeah. version. I own it. And there's not a lot of content on there compared to some other people's boxes. That's just true. I mean, you know, there's a limited number of, of channels that you've done deals with on there. Uh, well, the, the movie, you're also not. Movies are, there's, uh, I don't know, 16, 17,000 movies on there. It's incredible. That's good. He wants all of them. That's good. You don't stream them, though. I have to buy them. I mean, there's Netflix movies, of course. Yeah. But I can get Netflix well, you on can Roku rent and. TiVo and you can rent Google the movie. and all, everybody has Netflix. That's just table stakes. Yeah. You can rent the movie, though. And that's how most people do right. okay. watch movies. That I have to rent. buy the TV shows, though. You do if have I want to buy Game the of TV Thrones show. from last season. You I do have, have to buy, to buy the TV show. So you're not solving every problem that a person might have with the TV with your current product. I agree. And yeah, I agree. 
when you talk about owning the core technologies, what, what is the core technology in the television experience in your well, view? I don't want to get into that kind of detail, but I... I'm I just, it's just an I'm, academic question. I love question. you all. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was Carol, what question did you have? What's the core technology? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are good. I know. You've been working together too We're long. professionals. Um, all right. Besides you not answering with the core technology, we're assuming it's the television. So itself, uh, I'm going to assume that. Um, how is your relationship with Hollywood in that regard, in terms of getting everything? How do you look at Steve was very influential down there. How do you approach Hollywood people? I think we have very good relationships with the content owners. Uh, you know, we have great respect for the content owners. We, we don't want their stuff to be ripped off. Uh, you know, with, with, this is the way we felt about music. We loved music, and we wanted to provide a simple and elegant way for people to buy it because we felt that the vast majority of people were honest and that if they had that, they would pay for it. And a whole generation was, you know, growing up at the time that thought it should just be free. And if that, if that continued, you wouldn't have any artists anymore. If, if that happens to the movie business, we won't have any great movies anymore. Uh, and none, that's not good for any of us. Nobody really wants that. So you that. think the relationship is good? And so I think it's good. I think, I think that they... Uh, view us positively because we do care. I mean, th these guys have been buying Macs forever. You know, still, uh, most movies are edited on a Mac. And so these are longtime Apple customers uh, that, that were with Apple before iPod, before iPhone, uh, before iPad. And so there is a level of trust uh, in those relationships. Now, uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, Steve brought us even closer because he also owned a content business for a while. And, and that thinking and that way of looking at it, I think, greatly helped us. What would be their complaint about you? I mean, even though if they personally like your... It's probably, you know, a, it's probably better care to ask them... We, I'm going to tomorrow night, Ari Emanuel. I'm sure he has a lot to say. I, um, I think you should ask him. Not paying and, uh, them enough? What, what, would you, what would you say you probably hear from them? I don't, I don't think you're going to hear that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, are you, are I've met with several of them recently, and uh, we... There were great conversations because they were talking about what more we could do together in, instead of you know, there, some issue or, or whatever. And so I, I, it'll, I'm interested to hear what you hear. Are you working on a, some kind of content service that, that I could use in my living room? Other than the one, you know, I mean, obviously you have iTunes, it's very famous, but. Uh, New tunes. New tunes? New iTunes. Use that. New Please service. Feel free. What, what, what question did you have, Kara? I was <laughs> are you Every working time you say that, we assume it's yes, right, yeah. by the way. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. I've got to come would up with you something do, Since he's not going to answer that one, um, would you do a thing like Google's doing with YouTube and start funding original programming and things like Would you see Apple ever doing that? We've got a series of good ones like this. Yeah, I think... I don't think Apple has to own a content business. Uh, we haven't had an issue, for the most part, in getting content. And so, you know, you look at songs, and, and we have 30 million songs. Uh, I think virtually every song out there is... 30 million? 30 million songs. Um, we have double-digit thousand movies. Uh, we have 100 and over 100,000 TV episodes. Uh, those get a little more difficult as you get out into countries because they have separate ownership within each country. Uh, but, but for the most part, getting content isn't an issue. And, and so I think that, I think there's a great art in doing content right, and I have great appreciation for the content owners. And so, 
I think this is an area where Apple partnering well is the right approach. So not making or funding content? Not, not making it. Funding it, uh, well we fund it through, the, the greatest thing that we can provide for the content owner is to sell lots of their stuff. And so if we can make a very simple and elegant solution uh, with their content, then that's the best thing that we can do for all parties. The consumer loves it because they get it when they want it, where they want it. Uh, the content owner is getting paid for it, and so they love that. It's not being ripped off. And it's, it's great for us as well because it builds our ecosystem. Tim, yep. um, speaking of partners, what is going on between you and Facebook? Uh, Facebook is a great company. Uh, I have great appreciation for them. But yet, in, on my Apple devices, uh, there's a menu that comes up for sharing. Twitter is yep. all yep. through it. Yep. Facebook is not. There's no Facebook. They have 900 million people. Why weren't you able to strike a deal? Would you ever strike a deal? What's your relationship? I think, we can, I think the relationship is very solid. Uh, I saw Cheryl earlier, and so you can ask her on your break. Uh, I think it's very solid. We have great respect for them. I think we can do more with them. Um, and so, you know, just stay tuned on this one. So, stay are they, tuned, are they still, tuned. one of the things Steve told me is that they stay were tuned. onerous. Are they still onerous? They have their way of doing things, and, uh, <laughs> but people could say that about us as well. They do say that about you. They do. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, but because you have a point of view doesn't mean you can't work with other people. And as a matter of fact, I think, in many cases, I've found over the years that two people that have strong points of view can appreciate each other even more, and their relationship is much longer lasting. Aren't you kind of must-haves for each other in a lot of ways, given think, the competitive you know, for us, uh, for us, we want to provide customers simple and elegant ways to do the things they want to do. And Facebook has millions, hundreds of millions of customers. And and so any, anybody that has an iPhone or an iPad, we want them to have the best experience with Facebook on those platforms. So there will be a better experience. So stay tuned. So stay tuned. So stay tuned. Uh, speaking of uh, other stay tuned, yeah. uh, not a lot of things have been purchased over the many years by Apple. Um, do you see more acquisitions under the Tim Cook regime? Uh, we continue to buy companies. Uh, we've, you know, we, they're not ones that we seek to make public, but we, we buy companies. Well, eventually and, you have to tell us, correct? Uh, it depends on the amount of it and so forth. If I don't have to, I don't. Right, okay. Uh, <laughs> they, just, they just put them in this room. Wait, is that part of the doubling down on secrecy? That's a part of the doubling down. Uh, but you're going to do it more or less. We'll do I don't it. think you can out secrecy. You're going to out secrecy Steve Jobs. Steve but I'm looking Jobs. forward to it. Is that correct? It. Is that what you're saying? I, I'm saying that I feel strongly that being secretive on the product side of our business. You're is killing so me here. So important. <laughs> it's so important. All right. Speaking of the companies you've hidden in, in the black room at Apple. Yeah. Um, do you see big acquisitions which you can't avoid people noticing? Say buying a Twitter buying, did you look at Instagram, for example? No, we didn't look at Instagram. Um, do I see big ones? You can't I, I hide those under I the wouldn't rule it out. Uh, I'm not looking at a big one right now. We're not looking at a big one right now. Uh, but I wouldn't rule it out. And, and so for us, you know, we, historically what we've done, we haven't bought a company for revenue strain. Right. We've bought a company because they have great people cool technology, great IP, uh, and there was a synergy with a product that we were working on. There was something, maybe it, be, it, maybe it would become a feature of the product. Maybe there were great skills that we could redeploy onto another project. And so we've done several of those, and I think that we will do several more. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, but. And I wouldn't say we would never do one for revenue, but it's not how we're wired. We're not wired for that. And well, you're okay with most internet companies on that then, so. 
<laughs> Touche. Yeah, except he actually has revenue. Yes, I and know And profits. No, but buying a company for revenue. I understand. Touché. You would have been perfect for Instagram. So, um, well, wait a minute. Can, can I just, because I think there's Please. a segue here. Please. So you bought a company called Siri. Yes. Siri actually launched at this conference, mm -hmm. and within a matter of months, you bought them. So we take credit for that. Right. But, um, but Siri is, and, and it's in your ads, it's your, it's in, at least at the moment, it's your principal way of selling the iPhone 4S, which as you pointed out, has sold in large numbers. When the new, it works. The new John Malkovich ad. John Malkovich, Freaky Samuel L. Jackson, you know, yeah. whatever. When it works, I'm sorry. Go ahead. When it works, it works really well. It's kind of like magic. But a lot of times, it actually doesn't work. And that's not what a lot of people have come to think about Apple products. Mm -hmm. It says, I can't help you with this at this moment, or misunderstands you, or it gets the thing wrong. And it's a beta. Yeah. You, you know, so what's going on with that? Well, Is that product up to your standards? And customers love it. Customers First of all, love customers it. love it. It's uh, one of the most popular features of iPhone 4S, which is our most popular, the most popular selling phone in the world, I guess. But there's more that it can do, and we have a lot of people working on this, and I think you'll be really pleased with some of the things that you'll see over the coming months on this, where the breadth that you're talking about uh, we've got some cool ideas about what Siri can do. Uh, and so we've got a lot, we have a lot going on on this. Is voice critical to these phones going forward? I think Siri's proven to us that people want to relate to the phone in a different way. And, you know, for years there wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of invention in the input. And then touch came along, it was a very cool different way. And, um, and I think voice, particularly when it's combined where, where it understands the context, not just voice recognition. Voice recognition has been around for a long time. Uh, maybe it didn't work at different times and so forth over the term of it. But what really makes Siri cool is that she has a personality. You know, she becomes many people's best friend. I mean, yes. it's Isn't that, that a little sad. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm not, I'm not a judge. Uh, Although, you know, a woman not listening to me is not the story of my life, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you're going to be really pleased with where we're taking Siri. Is that more responsive, bossier, what? <laughs> Is that what you're looking for? I'm always looking for that. <laughs> um, a little secret. We'll see. We'll see. But I, I think you're going to be really happy with it. I really do. And it is key. It is profound. I'd put it on the profound list. You know, there's not. Is too it the many AI piece of it that's? Look, you could put probably. I'm guessing a different voice recognition module than the one you have in there now. And I'm not saying it's, it's pretty good, but I mean, you could put a better one, a different one, yeah. whatever. It's not voice recognition, it's understanding. It's the, under, it's the context, the AI. It's what you that's call That's when you say something's profound, that's what you're talking about. That's what I'm talking about, yes. You know, this is something that people dreamed of for years, I think. And, and it's here. It's really here. Now, yes, it can be broader and, uh, and so forth, but we see unbelievable potential here. And, you know, Siri uh, as a feature is sort of, it has moved into the mainstream. People hear the word Siri and they know what you're talking about. It's amazing that this has happened in, uh, since just October of last year, not very long ago. And, so I think you're going to be really happy with where it's going. So really um, I we're this, doubling down on it. I asked this question of uh, Steve uh, in the last interview about what he does all day. Yeah. And he gave a fantastic answer. Um, I have two questions actually. One is, what do you do all day? What do you see your role at Apple 
as you know on a daily basis. And then secondly, are, are you, do you consider yourself a visionary? I mean, that was sort of stuck onto Steve's uh, name, visionary leader. Steve. Yeah, Steve was a genius and a visionary, and um, and you know, I've never really viewed that my role was to replace him. I think he's an irreplaceable uh, person that, Steve was an original, and I don't think there's another one of those being made. And so I've never really viewed or, or felt the weight of trying to be Steve. It's just, it's not who I am, and uh, uh, it's not my goal in life. You know, uh, I'm, I am who I am, and that's, that I'm focused on that, and, and being uh, a great CEO of Apple. Uh, and it's incredible every day to work with what I consider to be the smartest and most innovative people on earth. And so I spend my day working with those people uh, on many different things, some things we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about maybe, and many things that, that go with running a, uh, a company of, of Apple's size and, and, and in all the geographies that we're in and, and so forth. And I love every minute of it. It's an incredible place to be. It, it gives me, uh, it is my oxygen. So that's how strongly I feel about it. Can I just add one yeah, question please. to that? And then, I don't know where yeah. the clocks are. I know our are. clocks aren't up. We know, I'm are. watching the clocks. You need to make like secret clocks or yeah. something. But, um, we could have set an alarm on the iPhone. Well, they are we working. could have, yes. We have gotten the toaster refrigerator out of them. Right? <laughs> that, that is a scoop. Um, um, who's the curator these days? At on Apple? what topic? Well generally on products. I mean, you know, the understanding was that the curator, he was an editor or a curator of a lot of these, these ideas or products. You know, we have a privilege because if I look around the executive team, many of the people are the people I've been working with for, for double digit years. And we all know each other really well and have great respect for one another and work together well. Uh, the curator role moves as it's always moved. It has always moved. It's always moved. It was a myth that he did it all. He never did it all. Uh, do you, I think if he were sitting here, he would tell you that no one person can do it all. Okay. He, he said that a, a gazillion times. Yeah. And I mean, look at what we're doing. You, that's not possible. You could have an S on your chest and a cape on your back and not be able to, to do everything. And so it, his, he brought in great people to the company and set a standard for who they brought in. And that became a, that built an incredible company. His legacy will be leaving that foundation. His spirit will always be uh, in the DNA of the company. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't get overly focused on who does what piece. Uh, with a company doing all the things that we're doing, there's a lot of key people, a lot of key people. And there has always been a lot of key people. So what is your, last question, and then we'll get to yeah. the audience. What's your goal? Become a trillion dollar company? No. Be very, I, I very don't. secretive? Create your own CIA, <laughs> AIA? <laughs> I just want to build great products. I want to build great products. And it's, that's not, there's, there's not a specific revenue goal or, or I think if And keep we, them really secret until you're ready to say something. There you go. Yeah. I think if we do that, that the other things follow. I think companies that get sort of confused and think their goal is revenue or, or a pro certain profit or whatever, or a, stock, or a stock price of something. Those things you can't focus on and make better. You have to focus on the things that lead to those. 
And for us, that's all about great products. And so all of our energies are on that, not the result of that. And looking out at the not Apple, who is your, what do you look to? No one, know, no one knows as much about you as they did about Steve Jobs. What do, you, what do you look up to? Is there a person or a company or a... Oh, you mean heroes yeah. and so forth? Oh, I have uh, ones that are deceased or ones that are living, you know? I, if you walked in my office, you would see uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. That's who you would see. Uh, if you're talking about CEOs that I think that are living, that are doing fantastic jobs, I have incredible respect for Bob Iger and what he's done at Disney. And, I, and it's, uh, you know, it's a, a great fortune for us to have him serve on our board now. Uh, and, and, you know, there are others. I've had some great opportunities to meet some people I didn't know in the, in the last several months. And, so that list is, is growing. Great. Okay, thanks. Questions. Yeah. Questions. The mics are. You have to go to the mic. Of, yeah. <laughs> one here, there's one there, there's one over there. Okay. All right, let's start. Because there's never any interest in Apple. Yeah. yeah. Right here in the middle. Go ahead. Hi, Tim. John Turner from uh, Brandeis University. Uh, Apple has been uh, traditionally very strong in higher ed markets, but uh, one area that uh, many years ago kind of dried up were deep discounts for institutional purchases, both for higher ed and for K-12 teachers. For example, I pay the same price that, uh, for an iPad that everybody else pays. Do you see that changing in Apple's culture, uh, investing in higher ed, giving us uh, uh, good discounts to, to make education affordable again? What we've done with education is, actually there is still a discount for institutions and for individuals. And each year during the back to school season, uh, we've historically sweetened that in some way, some sort of offer or something that, that a student would like. And so we're gonna keep doing that. Education is very, very important to us. The, the iPad actually does sell at a lower price in the K-12 than it does in the, in the consumer markets, when they buy in volume, which, which they are today doing. Um, and so we're gonna continue offering those. Last year, just last year, those uh, discounts or donations were three quarters of a billion dollars. So it's not an insignificant amount. And maybe even more the case, in education in general, we're doing other things that I think have a profound effect on people. Like if, if, you, if you're familiar with iTunes University, millions of people are taking courses, great courses from great instructors on iTunes U. If you're not taking one, I would encourage you to look out there. There's some, very, there's some great stuff out there. Um, all of the, we're, doing, we're doing all this for free. We're not doing this to make money. We're doing all this for free because we think it can really make a difference. We launched iBooks Author in January. This is a tool that most people would have charged thousands of dollars for. We're giving it away for free. We're giving it away so that people can make textbooks uh, because we think that the textbook is an incredible thing if done right for the student versus today's textbook that is dog-eared and seven years old and behind on the times. And so we're going to continue to do things like this that we think can really change teaching and learning. Uh, this is, education has been a foundation of Apple since the very early days, since the very, very early days of Apple, and continues to be today. And we're really proud of what we're doing. Thank you. Over there. Uh, Adam Lashinsky with Fortune Magazine. Hi, Adam. Hi, Tim. It's nice to be able to ask you a question. Kind of an interesting hug. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Touche. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice to be able to. Um, more like a good God, Tim. Tim, you've. Uh, yep. Thank you, Kara. He just Tim, said, yeah, by the way. So go ahead. You've uh, said in the past that an important part of the Apple culture is to be self critical. Um, Kara and Walt have uh, commented a couple of times that this is an audience that doesn't know you very well. Mm -hmm. Would, would you talk a little bit about your strengths and weaknesses as a CEO and as a person? 
<laughs> and then and then Adam's going to reciprocate. Is that? <laughs> that's. Oh, Walt, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> you mean a, a, a public performance appraisal? I think you're best to do that, Adam. <laughs> I think you're the best to do that. I'll go, leave that to go you. Go for it. Go for it. I'll ref. I'll ref. Well, yeah. No, we got no, it. You got it. Got, it, got it, your point. <laughs> no, I think you should do it. I think you should do it. All right. Um, I'll leave that for you. There was a lot of attention on what specific things that Steve paid attention to. For example, he was very involved in marketing and, and design yep. as CEO. He was less involved with supply chain management because that was your expertise. Are, are you as involved in marketing and design as Steve was? Uh, no, not. Uh, it depends on what period of time you're talking about, probably. Uh, but Steve spent all, virtually all of his time on those two things. And of course, toward the end, he was spending less time on all of those. Um, but no, I would say that I'm spending time in many areas, not, not exclusively those two. OK. And he's not going to run himself down. There you go. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Uh, Dan Hi. Palmer with uh, ReadWrite and SplatF. Uh, I have a question. You control a lot of the products and, and services you offer, but one of them that you don't, which uh, everything from your retina display graphics to HD video to Siri uses more and more of, is bandwidth. And I was wondering, is, is that something, you know, as the, as the very few companies that control all the bandwidth seek to kind of figure out new ways to make more money off of that, charge people more for it. Is that something you think that you need to either have an ownership stake in, more control than you currently have, or is it even regulated fairly right now? Yeah, a lot of questions in that. Let me, let me try to answer the heart of it. Is, do I think we need to own a carrier or, a, or, or the pipe? Uh, no, I don't think we need to do that. Uh, if, you, if you look at Apple's business, the vast majority of our business now is outside the U.S. And so owning something just in the U.S. would, would not have great value in the, in the total worldwide, uh, our worldwide footprint. Plus, I really think the guys that have it know a lot more than we do about this. This is their area of expertise, and, and we've tried to uh, be honest about things that where we can contribute in places where we can't. And I want to make great devices and, and use some of the bandwidth. But I, but I don't really feel like we have to own the pipe to do that. I think we can partner with the pipe owner. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lance, if you could stop texting, would you? <laughs> uh, thank, thank you very much. Yep. Uh, this has really been uh, interesting, uh, Tim. Uh, I'm Lance Yulinoff from Mashable, and uh, I just, you know, I have kind of a two-part question. Yep. Back in 1990... Remember short, because we got lots of questions. Right. Back in 1998, uh, when you joined Apple, what did, what did Steve Jobs tell you at that time to encourage you to join? I mean, the company was not in great shape. Uh, and the second part is, could you env have envisioned what would have happened? Did you see the future at that moment? It was a very interesting meeting. Uh, Steve had uh, hired an executive search firm uh, to find somebody to run operations. And I'd gotten a call a few times and said, you know, no, I haven't been in Compaq that long, and I, I like the people here. And they kept calling and kept calling. And, and I eventually said, uh, you know, okay, I'll talk. And uh, I flew out. I had no time. And so I flew out like Friday on a red eye for a Saturday morning meeting with Steve. And the honest to God truth is five minutes into the conversation, I'm wanting to join Apple. Yeah. And I was shocked <laughs> at this because it wasn't how I went into the conversation at all. 
And why did I want to do it? He, he painted a story, a strategy, that he was taking Apple deep into consumer at a time when I knew that other people were doing the exact opposite. And I've never thought following the herd was a good strategy. You know, you're destined to be average at best doing that. And so I saw brilliance in that. And he told me a little bit about what would later be named the iMac. And I saw brilliance in that. And I saw someone that was unaffected by money. And that's always impressed me with people that have it when they're unaffected by it. And so those three things, I thought, I'm going to throw caution to the wind and do this. And I went back and resigned immediately. And now, did I see every, did I see the iPhone and the iPad and the iPod? No. What I saw was Apple was the only technology company that I knew of including the one I was working at and, and had worked at, where if a customer got angry with the company, they would yell and yell loudly, but they would continue to buy. At Compaq, if people got angry at Compaq, they would just buy from Dell. At Dell, if they got angry at Dell, they would just buy at that time from IBM. And so people were moving freely to and fro, but an Apple customer was a unique breed. And there, were, there was this emotion that is so, you just don't see it in technology in general. You could see it and feel it in Apple customers. And so I knew that was different. And when I looked at the balance sheet of the company, I thought I could add something and participate in turning around what I thought was a great American company. And so th th that's the real story there. That's a great answer. I, oh, I think we okay. Stuart? Hi, Tim. Stuart Alsop. Um, I'm confused by the way you name products, and I'd, I'd love to understand the backstory on how you went from an iPad to an iPad 2 to an <laughs> iPad, or even from an iPhone 3 to a 4 to a 4S. Maybe you could just talk about how you go about naming products, and I'd particularly yeah. love to know about the iPad. It's a good question. Um, a lot of people ask me that about iPad. <laughs> if, if you think, if you look back at iPod, we had an iPod and we changed it a few times and we kept calling it iPod. And then when we announced a different iPod, we called it iPod Mini. And we changed that a few times, and we changed it massively. We, we called it iPod Nano. The Shuffle came out. We called it iPod Shuffle. And the next iterations of it, although, although they were starkly different than the first one, if you're familiar with what the first one looked like, we called those that iPod Shuffle. And we kept calling it iPod Shuffle. And so with iPad, iPad we looked at, and the Mac, by the way, is the same way. If you look at the first MacBook Pro and you look at how MacBook Pro has changed over the time period, and the same thing for MacBook Air and, and uh, actually iMac is like that too. Think of the first iMac, and today we're shipping an iMac. And so, and so you can do it either way is the, is the real story. You know, you can stick with the name and people uh, generally love that, and, or you can put a number at the end of it which denotes the generation or whatever. And if you keep the same ID, like in the case of the 4S, uh, we, we kept the 4 but put an S on there to denote a difference. And that, that S, some people would say, oh, that stands for Siri, and some people might say that stands for speed. Uh, what does it stand for? It's, we were thinking about Siri when we did it, but on 3GS, we were thinking about speed. If you remember the iPhone 3G and so which iPhone 3GS. 
And so it's kind of what we want it to be. Right. Ah. And so, <laughs> so my, my wait, only is point iPhone, is, is there an iPhone 5? The, the new iPad was not a I love it. The, the new iPad was the not a shocking new now way of, <laughs> of naming from an Apple point of view. It goes back to what we've actually done the most, the way we do the Mac and the, the way we've done iPod. And so it, it's, it probably was uh, talked about in a way that seemed like it was a more shocking change than it, than it was. It really wasn't a change. They just do it over drinks. That's so all, <laughs> so all the iPads are just going to be iPad. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's the iPad Q. Mini is just going to be. No, an it's going to be Q. It's going to be for quick or something. Who had the else. next question? All right. <laughs> Quintessence. Over here. Hi, uh, Warren Lee with Canaan Partners. Thanks for joining us today. So you've been at Apple for many years now, and when Steve Jobs took a medical leave of absence, you became the head of the company. I'm kind of curious now that um, you've been CEO for a few months now, what's the biggest surprise or challenge that you've encountered now that Steve Jobs is no longer with the company? You know, you know from being there for 14 years, it's not, it's not like I was walking into a, an unfamiliar place or working with unfamiliar people. Um, these were people I knew well and, and a culture that I love. And, and so all of the things that maybe a CEO coming in uh, to a new company would uh, see, no, I didn't have any of those challenges. Uh, so what, what, did, what shocking thing occurred to me? The, the very first one was I'm named CEO, and I start getting thousands of emails per day. Thousands. And the privilege of this is most of them are from customers. And they talk to you as if you're sitting in their living room because they have an intimate relationship with the company. It's, it's something I, I would guess is very different for Apple versus others. And so that was a little bit of a surprise. I was getting hundreds, but this went up by a huge multiple. And that's kind of continued. Today I view it as a privilege. I could never read every one of them, but I, I think it shows you the connection that we have with, with customers and with people, and that it's an emotional connection, not just a, you know, a transactional company. Apple's just not a company that somebody buys something from. And, and so that's one thing I'll throw out. The, the other things, I can't say anything other has surprised me. Um, you know, again, it's not an unfamiliar place. It's not unfamiliar people. It's uh, a company that I've been in love with for a long time. We're going to do them very quick questions. We want, we'd like to get to everyone, but sure. everyone's hungry. Try to make them shorter. Yeah, Jim, I'm going to get your quick thoughts on two emerging trends, or at least they seem to be emerging in the mobile space. One is wearable computing. We're seeing about a half dozen startups in the smart watch space trying to compete with that and still seems very nascent. And, and obviously, Google's working on their project glass and heads up display. So I just want to get your general thoughts on wearable computing and where that space might be going. And the second one is you talked about how Windows 8 or tablets might be going full circle in a bad way in terms of where Microsoft started with the tablet. So I wanted to get your thoughts on pen computing and whether Apple could play a role there and sort of pick up the mantle where Microsoft left off. <laughs> uh, wearable, I have on a uh, Nike Fuel Band. And so this is one of the things that you're, you're talking about. Um, I think there's some cool things that can be done. And I think it's an interesting area. And the, the, the question is, can it change someone's behavior for something like this? There's other companies doing you know, things like this, too. And I, I think the book hasn't been written on that yet. Uh, if it's just a cool thing to know, it will fade. But if it can really drive someone to act differently, to behave differently, then I think it can be pretty cool. 
And so I think the verdict is out, and um, it'll largely be determined by how much innovation is in that area. Uh, I think there are some good companies working on this, and so I think it'll be interesting. Microsoft? Um, and computing in general. Yeah. Um, I sort of like what we're doing right now, and uh, other things that we might be looking at that, that I think more fit into areas where we can make significant contributions. Thanks for your question. Josh. Hey, uh, Josh Topolsky from The Verge. Hi, Tim. Hi. Uh, so uh, I want to ask about something you didn't really touch on at yep. all, uh, but you're definitely in. You've sort of fallen into being a big player in the gaming space. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, most of the revenue generated in the App Store is, is from gaming and entertainment, right? I mean, you probably know uh, those numbers off the top of your head. Gaming is a huge category on the App Store. So you introduce mirroring. Uh, you can mirror to it. Apple TV, you can play a game on your TV. But you certainly don't own or even participate in the living room gaming experience in any significant way. Uh, it depends on whether you call the living room a console experience. Well, on the TV. Yeah. Um, so, so my question is, you have this big gaming, you're in the gaming space now, right? Yeah, But yes. Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony own the TV gaming space, and they're building on that, right? They're building these entertainment products, like Microsoft has all of these things you can do with, on your TV now. You guys only have the Apple TV and Netflix. Do, is gaming in your future? Do you see that as something you want to go deeper into? Well, I, I, I sort of view it a little differently than you do, I think. Is I view that we're in gaming now in a fairly big way, uh, one of the prime reasons people buy an iPod Touch is gaming. I mean, some people buy it for music as well, but a lot of people buy it for gaming. And, you, you know, I realize that's not the big screen that you're talking about. Uh, but gaming has kind of evolved a bit, and you actually have more people using, playing games on portable devices than you do on the, the big screen TV now. And so, uh, where we might go in the future, you know, we'll see. Uh, but this is an area where customers love games. Uh, we want to do things that customers want us to do. I'm not interested in being in the console business that's the traditional, or what, what, what is thought of today as traditional gaming. But if you view gaming more broadly than that, then I feel like we're a pretty big player today, and the things that we'll do in the future will only make that bigger. So is gaming on television something that you're <laughs> interested in? Uh, Last try. I think it could be interesting. I think it could be interesting. All right, Jordan, quickly. Oh, go ahead, and then we'll get, we're going to get to everyone very, but if you who's need standing. to speed it up. Yeah, who's standing? Um, no new people. I'm Jordan Golson from Mac Rumors, and thanks for the job, sorter. Um, you talked a lot about emotion of the, the customers. There's a lot of passion amongst yep. the customers. Do you think that the sort of attention that's paid to Apple from rumor sites and news sites and the New York, everybody, is a, a distraction or a driver, or, or how does that affect you and the company? I think it's a privilege to have people that care about the company and care enough to write and care enough to talk and care enough to uh, send me an email and say, you're out to launch on this thing and, and you, know, you, need to, you should be looking at this differently. Or, I think all of that is great. I, I love it. And uh, uh, do I want something printed on a website that's confidential? No. Uh, but that's not the question I think that you're asking is, I, I view uh, sort of our ecosystem as including uh, great sites that uh, care deeply about the company and, and want to inform customers. And I've got no problem with, with people that disagree with things that we're doing. I think that's, that's our country. I love it. It's great that we can have disagreements. And so that's how I view it. Thanks. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. He loves right. you. Over here. Oh, you. Hi, Tim. Yep. Hi. 
Enrique de Castro from Google. Um, you talked about, about DNA. Yes. Um, the size of the hardware industry is huge. The size of the software industry is huge. The size of the mobile industry is huge. Um, why advertising? Why? I'm Ad sorry? Why advertising for Apple? Oh, why advert? Oh, you mean IAD? Well, IAD is. Um, would be pretty small next to your advertising revenue. I mean, we know that. Like really, really small. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I wouldn't put it. If you noticed when I was talking about the things in Apple that make up the four legs of the stool, I didn't mention that one. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't see it at the same level by any means as the other as the other things in, the, in our company. It's, it's not, it's not nearly to us what it is to you, obviously. It's, we're, we're in different stratospheres there. Um, we're a product company. That, that's what we are. I heard you a lot uh, saying focus yeah. during the interview. Yeah. Can you make that I ad and focus, how they go together? So you want me to get out of the ad business? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm hearing, Tim. <laughs> I, I hope the FTC's not in the room. Um, Actually, he's the, here. He's the here chairman on of the FTC he is, is in the room. <laughs> OK, great. <laughs> John, are you taking notes? Yeah. You, you should know the chairman of the FTC literally is probably here. So. <laughs> I don't have any other Think comment. Think carefully how you phrase <laughs> the next question. Thank you. I love you for asking that. You want to say, please stay in the ad business. We love competition. Uh. Enrique is the charming Google. Go ahead. All right, we're over here. <laughs> ah. Hi. Hi. I'm Joanna Stern from ABC News, and I wanted to ask you about Ping. Uh, firstly, yeah, what, what really happened to it? And secondly, is that the last time we really are going to see Apple get into that social space? Are you leaving it up to other companies now? I don't think we have to. Apple doesn't have to own a social network, if that's the heart of your question. But does Apple need to be social? Yes. And, but the, the ways that we express that today are uh, integrating Twitter into iOS. Uh, and you'll see us integrate Twitter into the Mac OS as we introduce uh, Mountain Lion. It's, uh, some people think of iMessage as social, right? And so we've, we've done a very elegant solution there if you're familiar with iMessage. And you'll see more things along that in, in the future. Game Center is a... Uh, social activity, because you're, you're picking someone else to play a game uh, against or multiple players or whatever. And so things like this make our devices even more useful to people. And we'll, we'll do things like that. But that, to me, doesn't mean at all that Apple needs to own a social network. But you do. You have ping. Ping. So what happened to ping? Oh, I was did, carefully. Get if you noticed, Walt, I was carefully avoiding I, that. I did notice. Me. And I can tell I that in. you wouldn't well, let me. So uh, well, you're rather sly. But what happened? Oh, to ping? You know, I think. Hello. Yeah, my mic is off. Uh, you know, we tried ping, and I, I think the customer voted and said, you know, this isn't something that I want to put a lot of energy into. So are you going to kill it? Because I don't. I, last time I checked, I think it's still there. Some customers love it. Why it's just the the. There's not a huge number that do, and so. <laughs> you know, will we kill it? I don't know. I'll look at it. And as long as they email you on an every other day basis, you'll keep it for a while. Huh? Well, I don't want to say that. I don't <laughs> say that. No, you I. Could, uh, you could totally sell it to Google Plus, but let's go. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Uh, how you doing, Tim? Nick Bilton, New York Times. My question actually isn't for you. It's for Walt and Kara. Okay. Um, and uh, you oh, had the rare opportunity to interview Steve Jobs on stage. People, not many people got to do that. Uh, and you've had the rare opportunity to be the first person that's interviewed Tim Cook. Do you think he portrayed the vision of Apple uh, oh, and the future heaven. of Apple today? Um, and what are your thoughts on the interview? 
You know what? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> you know what, Nick? I'm not coming back. I, I, I <laughs> No, that's not true. You're, you're welcome back. Um, and I will look forward to reading your thoughts on the interview. And well, that was his answer. Yeah. I'm given the same answer. I mean, you know, I believe in competitive journalism. Well, we wish you had told us whether you're calling it the iPhone 5 or not. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, but, I wish he would have announced all his products here. I didn't expect him to, but, right. you know. No, perhaps, but the, the, the vision of did. the future of Apple from, from Tim, I mean, I think that, that's the question. This is the first interview. I think the, our tradition here at the conference has been to do two things. Let the audience and the other media that are here uh, judge it. And then we also own a website. We also have columns. And we can make some judgments, too. But you're just as entitled to do that. As, and we're not going to do it from the stage. You, okay. you do it. Yeah. See, isn't he as good as him? I know. I think he's charming for being here for the first time <laughs> so we can meet Tim Cook. Thank you. Thank Kara. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.